Greetings. Welcome to the Black Pill. Today we're talking about pacifism. Um, I'm a practicing pacifist, and I'll sort of explain the reasons for that at the end of the thing if you want to hear personal stuff. But let's begin with Gandhi. Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, Mahatma is not a name. It's sort of a, an informal title he picked up in South Africa. So Gandhi considered him British first, a part of the British Empire, and uh, an, an Indian person second for a while. His dad sent him to England to get his law degree, and uh, uh, Gandhi practiced international law. His first case was in South Africa. So he goes to South Africa, he gets off the boat, and immediately the Boers, the sort of white Danish um, colonials, start to hassle him. They hassle him about his skin color. He buys a first-class ticket on a train because he can afford it, and they make him sit in third class, and uh, he's not down for that. He paid for first class. He's taking first class. He has a law degree. He knows how things work. And uh, they kick him off the train. So he spends the night sort of sitting in a, in a, in a railway shelter, freezing and, and, and pondering his existence, you know, what just happened. Um, and, and he has to make a decision like, should I even be in this country? This country seems kind of stupid. He, he, he toughs it out and he, he, he campaigns the next morning, gets back on the train um, goes to his destination. So during his time in South Africa, he, he works on cases, but he also ends up leading some strikes and uh, really fighting against the, the systematic oppression of apartheid. He, he loses. He largely, he largely loses. You know, apartheid rolls on and on and grinds everyone under its feet for a couple more generations, but he fights. And so the people of South Africa... The oppressed people of Indian descent and also the oppressed people of Africa, they sort of give him this 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 title, uh, the the Mahatma, sort of the, the 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 great leader. So he goes home to India, and he's man, his eyes have kind of been opened about about white power, and his first struggles in India really are about garments, Mo, uh, uh, people. People make money weaving their own garments, and his his whole his whole life in India, he he wears the the sort of hand woven dhoti, um, because that's what people make, and he buys them from people in India. But the British want to monopolize the garment trade, and uh, they don't want people weaving things by hand, and so Gandhi really sees the sort of the British. Uh, fashion and textile industry is really a threat to the day-to-day -day economics of the people of India. And he takes the side of the people. And this leads him into um, a generation of sort of tussling with the British at various different levels. He's most famous, he's most famous for his work on Indian independence, which includes some hunger strikes uh, those hunger strikes often are about his own people. It's about uh, Muslims and Hindus just unable to reconcile, unable to get along as one unified people against the British. And so there's a lot of a lot of fighting and Hindus attacking Muslims and Muslims attacking Hindus. In the end, when the state fractures and becomes the the, the two nations of India and Pakistan, uh, his heart ultimately is. Uh, his heart's his heart's broken by that. Eventually, he ends up being assassinated by a Hindu who believes that he's sold out the Hindu people by wanting to work with uh, wanting to work with Muslims for for peace. But it's really during these years that Gandhi solidifies uh, solidifies a real working philosophy and almost a playbook for peaceful protests. There are strikes, there are sit-ins, there are peaceful marches. At one point in one of the marches, um, people get aggressive, and it's not super clear if they started or if they're defending themselves against a counter-protest. But Gandhi temporarily steps away from the movement at that time 
because he will only lead a peaceful movement. He'll only lead a peaceful movement. Okay. Then he comes back when everyone agrees to sort of uh, put down the, the clubs and the knives and so on and, uh, and do it peacefully. So that's, so that's Gandhi. In the nuttiest of nutty nutshells, that's Gandhi. So let's say you're the good Reverend Doctor Martin Luther King, and you've just been in the North for a few years, getting your Doctorate of Divinity, and you come home to segregation. That is, as, the, as your train crosses the Mason-Dixon line, you have to get off of the train and reboard it later in a segregated fashion. All of the friends and colleagues you've been talking to and drinking coffee with and eating sandwiches with, they get off and they go to the front of the train and you get off and you go to the back of the train and you can drink coffee and eat sandwiches, but only with other black people. And that's, uh, that's King's experience. Like when he's away at school, he's getting a, a feeling about, about American injustice. And it's really when he, when he goes home to the South um, yeah, that's, that's when that spark is, is fanned into a flame. So King would spend the rest of his life fighting against American apartheid. This, the, the system of segregation and Jim Crow, um, a lot, man, a lot of history as to how that got there. I'm going to leave that for other people to talk about right now. I am not an historian. I'm an existential psychologist. So you're looking for means, you're looking for tactics and strategies. You want to know, right? You want to know how, how do you fight? How do you fight just such a, a, a giant system so embedded in history and law? And who do you read? Well, you read Gandhi. So when you go through, uh, when you go through the good Reverend Doctor's autobiography, um, he, he gives all credit to Gandhi. He read, he read into it. He saw the sense in nonviolent protest. He brings it forward. So, so Martin's philosophy is, uh, really that the authorities are always looking for an excuse to kill you. Right. Um, the first bus protest. The Rosa Parks thing, uh, that was not the first time a black person was ever asked to give up their seat on a bus. And the Montgomery organizing folks were well aware of some other cases and they passed, they passed on them. They were looking for someone who didn't have any legal entanglements, who had respectable work, uh, someone sort of photogenic, I guess is the word you use today, who they can put up as their, their poster child for reform. There were cases previously and uh, the organizers were well aware that they were doing their own kind of discrimination against those, against those people in deciding not to use them um, as the poster child for their demonstrations. But what they knew was what happens in modernity. A black man is shot by the police. Uh, the social media fills up with implications that that black man was no angel, right? He was no angel. He had his own problems. Um, he was selling Lucy cigarettes. He did drugs once when he was 19. He and none of this is a reason to be murdered by police. And none of this is a reason to have to give up your seat to a white person on the buses when everyone's paying the same fare. But they are distractions, and those organizers knew they were distractions, right? So what King knew was they're looking for an excuse. They're looking for an excuse to discredit you. They're looking for an excuse to turn away, to support the police, and to murder you with lynchings or fire or bombings or various other 
various other violent means. So these days I'm an educator. In my classrooms, uh, I'm an adult educator. And in my classrooms, I'm often talking largely to white people. When we're talking about issues of racial inequity, when I explain, for example, uh, the war on drugs, the massive disparity between white and black people in terms of prosecution and incarceration, at the end of that talk, the white people are generally more supportive of the police. That is when I tell white people about the systematic oppression of black people, the white people are more in favor of the systematic oppression of black people. This is a problem. You have to pick your cases very carefully and you have to comport yourself in public absolutely perfectly to give people absolutely no excuses to support the other side in the case. So the Woolworth's lunch counter demonstration, those folks were trained. They spent uh, hours and days preparing for that lunch counter protest using nonviolent means. Um, I don't want to say using the writings of Gandhi because my brain is turning into liquid mush. If they weren't directly doing that reading, they were almost certainly aware of it by one means or another. But in those protests, they were going to get pie rubbed in their hair, hot coffee poured in their faces, every racial epithet you can think of and some that you can't thrown at them, a bunch of angry white people in their faces, poking them, sometimes literally poking and shoving, breathing in their faces, trying to provoke a reaction. And what happens in that circumstance if you react to the uh, antagonism? What happens if you let them antagonize you? Well, the second a black person lays hands on a white person, right, that's potentially lethal. Best case scenario, you wind up in jail and the white person's walking around free. Worst case scenario, you wind up dangling from a tree. So the, so the good Reverend Doctor, uh, Brother King, is absolutely in the works of uh, Mohandas Gandhi, the, the philosophy and the processes of nonviolent protest. So at this point, I'm just going to encourage you to go read um, Go read what Dr. King wrote about himself and about his process. But he really saw nonviolent protest as the only way to get work done. He absolutely sympathized with the uh, angry young men who would show up to protests armed, right? They'd show up to the meetings, the pre-protest meetings, the pre-march meetings and trainings. They'd show up and they'd say, they're going to beat us. Why don't we get ours in first? You know, when they, when they come at us, we'll start peaceful. But when they come at us, why not fire back? A lot of teaching and training went into this. Uh, that's what they want. That's what they want. You're going to turn, um, you're, you're, you're going to turn counter protests into a genocide that way. This will show on the six o'clock evening news every night, and they will only show the black men aggressing against the white men. They won't show the provocation. And even if they did, white America would think it was all justified. Okay. I guess there's one more thing Dr. King knew. He knew you couldn't win with violence anyway. If you're an American minority, if you're a black South African, you can't win with violence anyway. Uh, the white people have all the guns. The white people control the police. They control the army. They control the politics. They can dictate how you protest and they can change the law so that it's legal to drive pickup trucks through crowds. If we can get cops on trial, the DAs rely on the police force for their investigation and they're not going to do really a wholehearted job. Um, 
in prosecuting the police who they rely on. And even individual cops operate in a system where they need to be able to rely on their buddies. You start turning in cops for bad behavior and you're a cop. And then suddenly you find yourself in a, in a gunfight or a knife fight somewhere out in the big city. You're calling for backup and backup never comes. You can't win with violence anyway. Because when your protest turns violent, they show up with the water cannons and then the rubber bullets and then the tear gas and then the real bullets. And so pacifism, the pacifism of peaceful protest is, man, it's not passive. It is activism. Pacifism is activism. But it's the only kind of activism that in the long run possibly could succeed. And that's the other thing that, uh, it's the other thing that Martin knew. Ultimately, where does this go? It goes to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. They're marching from Selma to Montgomery, is that correct? And uh, they get to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and on the other side is like the sheriff with the riot gear and, uh, you know, 50 or 100 cops over there. They're all mounted. They're on horseback and they have batons and uh, uh, really surly attitudes. What the marchers know is when they get to the other side of that bridge, they're taking a beating. They're taking a beating. So they turn around. They turn around and talk Martin into sitting out. Yeah. They talk him into not crossing because he's the face of the movement. And he's therefore too valuable to risk in this fashion. And reluctantly, Martin agrees to sit this one out in safety. It's one of his great laments in the uh, in his autobiography. It's one of his one of his big anxieties. Like he didn't do enough. Um, so the next day, they reorganize and everyone goes across without Martin there, and they take the beating. They take the beating. Uh, this is where John Lewis famously gets his skull fracture. He's a young organizer at the time. You know, he's as much the backbone of the movement as, uh, as King is the face. Uh, and a cop hits him in the head with a baton and he falls to the ground, fractures his skull, um, clearly almost dies. This is part of why uh, Lewis had so much street cred, and it's why we still say good trouble today. Um, so all that happened, and if that was all, like, we we wouldn't remember it. The Edmund Pettus Bridge would not be a point where people rally once a year and remind themselves of their civil rights movement kind of spirit. But there was a journalist. There was a national level journalist with a film camera and he recorded everything that happened in black and white. It went out on the evening news. Just as Martin had predicted, it went out nationwide on the evening news. This was the point where that happened. And what white America saw, what the rest of America saw was armed riot police attacking black peaceful demonstrators. Nobody tried to defend themselves. Nobody fought back. They walked into the, into the lynch mob and took their beatings. White America was disgusted. America was disgusted. And this was really the, the, the turning point in the black civil rights movement. It could not have happened without pacifism. Those peaceful tactics were tried and tested. They were tried and tested in South Africa in, in apartheid. They were tried and tested in India during the British occupation. And those tactics eventually got Britain out of India. They were, they were tried, they were put into service in American apartheid. And they, and they worked, they were effective. Okay. 
So Martin has a lot to say about loving your enemy and a bunch of religious stuff. He was, after all, a pastor. Uh, some of his best speeches are, in fact, sermons. And for an atheist like me, you really have to read past the God, God stuff. But God notwithstanding, what is saying, what he's saying really, really, it resonates. It's true. That the peacefulness of the protest is pragmatic. It's the only way to effectively get the work done. Now, later, some social science studies are going to come out. Um, look at Chenoweth, for example. What happens when we overturn violent autocracies using violence? Well, you get like Cuba, you get one violent dictator replaced with another violent dictator, you get France after the revolution, and there's 20 years of Robespierre and the terror. Uh, pragmatically, peaceful protest, put, put your feelings aside, right? Get out of your feelings. Pragmatically, only peaceful protest ultimately achieves anything. The rest might vent some emotion, and it might seem like eye for an eye, Bronze Age kind of shit, but only peaceful protest gets the job done. So sort of a, the quickest of asides on Ta-Nehisi Coates and some of the uh, violence around the edges of the, the, the Black Lives Matter protests happened a, a, a couple of years ago now in response to the murder of George Floyd. Okay, so Coates, in his book, uh, Between the World and Me, he writes about people using the legacy of Dr. King to sort of uh, beat him about the face and neck, that like he's held to this impossible standard. And ultimately, bear in mind that King lost, the Reverend Doctor was assassinated. Civil rights have been set back. We're in a new American civil rights crisis. The fascists are winning and we're about to lose democracy. Ultimately, in the long run, on the grand scale, peaceful protest failed. Now, I'm going to contend that's because the Civil Rights Act got passed and people got tired. Um, white people sort of got fatigued. Uh, turned against the civil rights movement they were for because it just dragged on and on and on. It needed to because things still weren't getting done um, and still it's hard to get people to pay attention to problems that aren't their problems. So Coates kind of grows up with this legacy of Dr. King uh, sort of being used, to, to use, used as a shaming tactic. You know, like, what are you doing with your life? You're, uh, you're, you're listening to, to weird music and you're not going to school. And what are you doing with your life? By your age, Dr. King, yada, yada, yada. Um, and whenever people thought about civil rights in a way that would discomfort white people, you know, white people especially bring out the, bring out the Dr. King stuff. Uh, I wish you guys could just protest the way that Martin Luther King did. And those white people are ahistorical, you know? Uh, nobody liked Martin Luther King very much. He was, a, he was a thorn in the side of the white power structure. It was very inconvenient. He held up traffic. He got arrested a bunch of times. He went to jail. He risked his life every day and ultimately lost it. The protests were peaceful, but that doesn't mean nobody knew about them. They were peaceful and they were in your face, sort of clogging the arteries of whatever town they went into, holding up movement, bringing everything to a stop, until things were addressed that needed to be addressed. Okay. So sort of flash forward, sort of flash forward. Look at, look at Ferguson, look at Baltimore. A bunch of angry people in the street, okay? And anger is the most communicable of the human emotions. It really is. Anger flashes from person to person. We get into a, into a group of people. We turn into a mob. The mob sort of has its own mind. Uh, it's called depersonalization. And people in a big group start to act 
in accordance with what the group wants and their own personal interests and morality kind of get set aside. Okay, and then especially after the, the George Floyd murder and sort of the initial statements from the, uh, from the prosecutors and so on, it's very flashpoint kind of stuff out there, a bunch of mad people. Now they didn't all go to, we didn't all go to like peaceful protest trainings ahead of time. We didn't go sit in community centers and church basements and practice having people stream invective in our faces. And we just went out there. We just went out there. Uh, I was a, I was a late comer. Um, I have my own work to do and I do that work. Um, but later when armed counter protesters started showing up, I showed up, uh, because if people are going to be out literally risking their lives, I'm going to risk my, my life with, with, with theirs. You know, my ordinary human experience is, experience is not one of being counter protested with guns and being intimidated by the police. And so I go to pride. I'm not gay, but I go to pride and I'm not black, but I go to black lives matter, especially when it's risky. I pick a spot. I pick a spot that is the, I, I try and, I try and imagine that I'm going to drive a truck through the protest and try and kill people. And I look for where I would drive that truck if it were me. And I stand there. Will that stop a truck? No, I'm just a human body. They'll have to go through me and they will go through me. It's not about stopping anything. It's about, it's about sharing risk. It's about sharing risk so things are fair. All right, so those, those protesters in the first few days, they don't have any training. They don't have any skills. They are just angry people showing up to show their anger. And so, you know, some fires get started and some buildings get spray painted. And then there are instigators, right? The people who say they're Antifa and they're really modeling more off of the uh, uh, Hong Kong movements. They dress all in black and cover their faces. They have umbrellas in case of tear gas and they are there to instigate some shit, but the instigation is catchy, right? Um, and the, and the, 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 the first couple times people are showing up, uh, the organizers here were well-intentioned and kind of amateur. And then the old heads kind of came in and, and took control when, when silly things were kind of happening, the old heads kind of stepped in and, and, and took control and organized, soothed things down, you know, kicked some of the loonies out. So here we had white power militias showing up with uh, AR-15s and they said they were here to protect us against Antifa. And they, they were really trying to get people to admit that they were Antifa. They were intimidating. It's like if people start smashing windows, we will start shooting. That was their message. They never said, but also said in doublespeak. All right. And initially, the organizers accepted them in and let them march with us, but they weren't there to march for rights. They were there to intimidate people looking for an excuse to start violence. And so after the first couple of days, the old heads you know, take over and those guys get pushed out. Uh, they end up um, overlooking the protests you know, they set up their, they set up their rifles. Uh, so they're not pointed at us, but they're pointed over our heads. And in a second, they could grab the, the, the stock of that weapon and turn it into the crowd. Um, the police won't do anything about that. And there's like police and militia cosplayers and whatever out there. And it's very chaos. And uh, we have open carry, not much you can do. And so you stand under the, under those rifles and you and you do what you're doing peacefully. Anyway, uh, you can't be intimidated. So that's kind of what happens is sort of the, the 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 rationale, the training, the philosophy of peaceful protest movements. Some people still know about it, and some people still embrace it. Some people don't. And uh, I'm not here to tell people how to protest. Again, um, 
my rights just aren't on the line at the same level in the same dimension as the rights of people of color. I'll show up and support, I'll show up and share risk, but I'm absolutely not going to tell people whether they should or should not be like Martin Luther King. I will say that I was inspired by his philosophy. A few years ago, I read everything that Martin wrote, and it struck me, it makes sense, it accords with the modern science. If you're going to get things done, peaceful protest is the way. And so that's what I'm here for. Okay, last thing on Martin Luther King. Uh, Two-thirds or so of the way into his autobiography, he reveals that he's not unconditionally a pacifist. He's not unconditionally for a peaceful means of protest. What he says is that these kinds of protests only work if your enemy, your opponent, has a conscience. And we're just very clearly in an age where the opponents of civil rights do not have consciences. How could you have a conscience in modernity and still oppose civil rights? As educated as we are, as, as much as we know each other, as much as people are our neighbors, and as much as we see our own rights, white people see our own rights being eroded by the people who want to erode black civil rights, how could you have a conscience and still mobilize race hatred? So there's some unknown number of self-immolations that happen in a given year. People go to the National Mall, douse themselves in gasoline or kerosene or something, light up a lighter and burn themselves to death to protest various things. Uh, foreign wars and whatever's on their mind, we don't know. Um, because the reporting about it is very, very thin on the ground. In good faith, what the news channels seem to think is that if they covered those protests adequately, then you would get a lot of copycat protests, and, the, and that's people self-immolating is uh, almost always lethal. People don't survive that. Um, and so it would be irresponsible to cover that news. What that means is it gets ignored. The Wall Street protests um, were just roundly ignored. Um, there are protests in China, and the Chinese government cracks down on them. There are no cameras there to see what happens, and so it gets ignored. Uh, China is taking control of all the media in Hong Kong, and so we're not hearing any more about those protests. Right. Right. So if you are the subject of a peaceful demonstration in modernity, all you have to do is ignore it. Don't give it any oxygen. People will get tired. People will lose the countenance of the public. It goes away and nothing ever changes. In modernity, just the people we're up against clearly don't have consciences. Donald Trump has no, has no, has no moral conscience, right? Okay. So that's the last note on, on, on the Reverend Doctor. I am not here to tell anybody what to do. I want you to understand why he made the choices he made and why so many people followed him at that time in American history. Okay, let's go to the 60s. What else is happening in the late 60s? The war in Vietnam, leading up towards the 1973 ceasefire. Post-traumatic stress. When I'm working with clients who experience PTS, I try and leave the D out of it. Uh, the disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, because uh, as far as I'm concerned, most of the time, that's an adaptation. Post-traumatic stress is an adaptation to dangerous circumstances. When you can't protect yourself, when, when things are out of your control, um, when people really are shooting at you, or you really have been a victim of a sexual assault, uh, various other means of getting PTS, man, the, it, your locus of control has been dragged away. 
it's just adaptive. Like a, like a soldier in Kabul needs to be paranoid about glints of light in, in, in windows and that roadside litter could conceal bombs. And so I don't want to take that away from people. The adaptive things in PTS, I don't want to take those away from people, you know. And then where it becomes a disorder is when the trauma's over, the bad thing has happened, it's in the past, and we're safe. But you're having those reactions at like, uh, I was going to say Applebee's, but in my town, you really can get shot at Applebee's. You know, you're at Red Lobster or something, and you're sitting in the corner and scanning the crowd and watching the entrances and all that. Pretty dysfunctional. Some of the emotional reactions, you know, one of my, one of my people, family, acquaintance, asked for a Denver omelet, and the, and the wait staff brought him some scrambled eggs with ham. And he was so mad. He could see the difference between those two things. He was so mad he had to go sit in the car and smoke a joint, you know. That's a PTS reaction. Uh, buddy had been blown up in Afghanistan. He's having a PTS reaction, an emotional reaction. Uh, you know, not really encoded in autobiographical memory, but a reaction. So PTS, um, in modernity, it's largely about these, these survival things that happen to us when we're under stress. In the 60s, the birth of PTS... Uh, is in anti-war protest. So here I'm getting into Ethan Waters' Crazy Like Us, that 2010 masterpiece. Um, yeah, in the, in the first days, they were looking at shell shock. People, you know, that was the World War I and II diagnosis, shell shock. People have been through this thing and they've acquired a thousand yard stare. They're just laying in the hospital bed, staring into space. Their experiences have been so traumatizing. They've been pushed out of reality. Um, but in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, we came to understand this as a moral injury. People have been pushed into doing actions that they would never condone. Uh, they're, 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 working on, they're working on R.D. Lang's presumption that sometimes you have a moral conflict so thorny the only thing you can do is go crazy, you know? So you're a British fighter pilot. You shoot down the, the Nazi plane. The Nazi bails out and is parachuting, and they're going to land safely somewhere. You're going to have to fight them again, right? They're a weapon of war as much as that plane is a weapon of war. And so you circle around and point your machine guns at that helpless parachutist now, and you murder them in the sky in cold blood. And that's what you do, and that's what you have to do. Well, if you're a God-fearing Christian in England in 1944, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. And you're killing. You're killing in cold blood. You have to. It would be immoral, in one sense, to let that Nazi get back into a plane and, and the murders that they would do later. Uh, it's a no-win moral situation. And so you kill. But later, the only solution to this moral conundrum is to go crazy. Right? So the, uh, so the, so the anti-war protesters... Uh, soldiers are getting off planes in the U S and Americans are spitting on them. They see the, these guys didn't volunteer to go to Vietnam and defend capitalism or something. They were drafted against their will to fight in a place. They had no idea of the politics of who they were shooting at or why. Um, but they came home and people would spit on them and, throw things at them, and sometimes beat them up. So the anti-war people were scooping up returning soldiers and talking to them about their moral injuries, then using, using this talk of moral injury to further oppose the war. Okay. So all this is to say that there's a resurgence of talk of moral injury in the literature. When you're in the psychology journals... 
and you're looking for information about PTSD, the way that it's defined in the DSM-5, you're going to have to wade through quite a bit of discussion of moral injury to get there. Moral injury is what happens when you're in that R.D. Lang situation. You know, people are peaceful and getting people to shoot at other people is actually somewhat difficult. Contrary to what you see on the six o'clock evening news every night, man, there are 328 million American citizens living in America and we're not really sure how many non-citizens on any given day. Um, and you can drum up maybe three or four stories about somebody shooting somebody or something uh, so that you can sell time for ad revenue, right? It's actually really difficult to get one person to shoot another person. So, so that's it. We have drone operators they're maybe in a in a in a trailer in California or something flying this drone halfway around the world, getting it on target, pushing the the button that fires the the payload, which is a missile or a bomb, blowing stuff up. And you can tell them this is all for some kind of a some kind of a good cause, and those people are terrorists. We either fight them over there or we fight them over here. But that person goes home every night knowing they countermanded the biggest of the commandments, thou shalt not kill. They have no way of knowing whether the people in that truck were, were hauling explosives to blow up, uh, blow up our evacuation efforts in Afghanistan. Or if they were just hauling water, actually. If they were just hauling water. These are moral injuries. With all of that in the can, there's a problem Ian Danskin refers to as the Gandhi trap. And I'm going to try and link that for you if I remember with my brain melting. I'm going to try and link that for you. Um, so this goes back to that problem of white people telling black people how to protest. Colin Kaepernick wants to s stay seated for the national anthem. Uh, a buddy comes along and they're a Marine and they're like, it's really disrespectful to sit for the flag. You're going to turn people off. Uh, you should kneel for the national anthem. There's a long tradition of kneeling for the anthem. It shows respect. Uh, but also kind of gets your point across. So he does. He decides he's going to kneel for the anthem. He takes that advice. And the right-wingers just go fucking crazy anyway. Um, because they don't want cops to stop shooting black people. They're fine, actually. It's a feature of the system that cops shoot black people because this is a white nationalist movement. Right? It was always going to happen. However you protest, the right-wingy folks are going to have a problem with it. Not because they're inconvenienced. They can get a lot of people on board with feeling inconvenienced, right? Uh, I just want to watch the ball game. I don't want to think about race issues while I'm watching the ball game. Like, just do this somewhere else. Do it where I can't see it. I'm just trying to get to work through town. Why do you have to have your protest downtown where it's in my way? Okay, there's a lot of privilege there. If you spend a lot of time thinking about that, it's pretty gross. But those people are not necessarily white nationalists. The white nationalists can recruit them into making noise on Twitter and shit. Okay? The white nationalists uh, do care about the issues on the opposite side. And so just what think so just think about what it means to be on the opposite side of civil rights movements, right? You're against civil rights and so you can get you can get support from white people who aren't necessarily against civil rights but don't know anything, don't understand anything about the movement. Um don't let privileged people tell you how you can and can't protest. 
don't let the government tell you what is and is not within bounds for protesting. Um, protest is protest, and make sure that your protest is proportional to the problem, all right? The Gandhi trap is where we get a bunch of people willing to starve to death and self-immolate and get shot by right-wing assholes with AR-15s and not do anything about it. Well, then we're all dead. We're all dead or we're all in prison and the goddamn fascists control the government, right? That would be the Gandhi trap. You're not Gandhi. So just to reinforce the fact that I'm not here to tell anybody why how to protest, you know, what is and is not within bounds. I'm a pacifist. I've done the reading. I know the science. I've been in the situations. I've been assaulted a hundred plus times and I haven't fought anyone. My priority is always keeping the assailant safe. But you have to make your own choices in your own context. So I understand uh, I'm a pacifist of privilege. That is... What led me to pacifism is exactly not getting hurt. Uh, so my wife and son, they take martial arts classes. They know how to defend themselves. I don't sell pacifism to them. I hope my son eventually learns it. I hope he eventually learns it. But if he does, it's going to be because he is safe and can, can look after himself. All right. So uh, be good out there. Be good out there. I was going to say be safe out there, but man, I don't know your circumstances and maybe personal safety is morally contraindicated. So just fucking just be good out there. As promised, the last part of the talk, in case anybody cares, is why I'm a pacifist. And here I am, I'm a pacifist. Greetings, my name's Jason, and I'd rather die than kill. I'd rather get hurt than hurt somebody else. To a degree, I was born this way. You know, when I'm 10 and getting bullied, uh, I'm not particularly thinking about the burden of pain that I would have to carry if I fought back. I'm just frozen. I'm an autistic kid. Uh, my brain circuitry doesn't work the way others' brain circuitry works. And when people are, 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 are hitting me and punching me and jumping up and down on my back, I have no programming to handle it. And so I just lay there and take it. Um, that's bad. At the time I hated, I hated about myself. Uh, but I do learn something from it. I do learn something, which is the worst anyone can really do is hurt me. No one succeeds. No one succeeds in injuring me really in any way. And then through my career working in human services and adults with disabilities, later at the psychiatric hospital, and in my personal life, I've led quite a violent life. And uh, I've been assaulted more than 100 times. In none of those assaults has anyone succeeded in hurting me. One dude punched me in the jaw and it ached for a couple of days, and that's the worst that's ever physically happened to me. I'm a pacifist of privilege, really. Yeah. Yeah, what I learned in all that is the worst you can do is hurt me. And I learned in existential psychology that if I die... I'm not around to know about it, right? So someone out there is thinking, well, Jay, they could kill you. Eh, kill me. I'm not afraid of that. When I'm dead, I'm not around to know that I'm dead. Right? Which guy is it? Is it Epictetus? Uh, where I go, death is not. Where death goes, I am not. The worst you can do is hurt me. Uh, hurt is just an inconvenience and I'll get over it. But if I hurt you, if I hurt you, that's something I have to live with. As long as I'm alive, I have to have that knowledge in me 
that I harmed another person. And if I were to kill somebody else, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I could live with that. I'm crazy enough, and, and I don't know if I can go crazy as a solution, as R.D. Lang suggests. That would be a blot. I'm not particularly spiritual. And the only way really to talk about this is in terms of soul, that it would be a blight upon my soul. I am not willing to give you that. I'm not willing to take that blight for you. There is a line. There's a line that I will not, I will not cross. I'll take physical injuries. I will not take a moral injury. Mm -hmm. This has been, uh, this has been pacifism with the black pill. Why are you even watching this? I don't know why you're still watching this. Go, go, go do something.